So again, thank you for being here today. We are in week two of our worship study that we're calling Proskuneo. Proskuneo. If you were not here last week, the image that you see on the screen, I believe, best maybe reflects out of all the things that we could come up with what true worship, biblical worship is. The word proskuneo is the most common word in the Greek language, the Greek New Testament, for what God desires of worship as God expresses worship. It is that com- Coming forward and bending and bowing and literally humbling ourselves in his presence. And I, I really do think it's safe to say that if we do not do that, we have not worship. Now, it may be at times more of a, 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 more of a mental, more of a, a heart bending than it is a physical bending. Do I believe that we always have to physically bend the knee? Well, there's a lot of us in this room that that has become very painful, Right? And I believe God understands that, but I believe God wants us to bow. And there is something, you know, I draw back from my old psychology days for uh, sometimes, and I, I know that there is a connection between literally the physical posture and the condition of the heart. And there is something that connects supernaturally when you physically bow in his presence. And if you can't bow in his presence, just roll over on your face and say, God, I am, I am as low and as humble as I can be physically. And God, today I want to worship you. Last week we began in Psalm 95. Let me encourage you to open your Bibles up there. We're going to continue. We only got to two verses. And truthfully, we only did about one and a half verses of Psalm 95. So let's go right back there of this morning. While you're turning, let me just remind you of what I believe is a a biblical example, my definition, I guess I should put it that way, of what proskuneo really is. I would say that biblical worship is unapologetic, expressed worship. And I believe that describes this concept of proskuneo. It is unapologetic, expressed worship. In other words, I I don't care what anybody thinks. I I don't care who's watching me. I I don't care what they like or dislike. I, I am going to unapologetically express my love to God. And you go through scripture over and over and over. We'll touch on some of these examples throughout the summer. But that's what you see when people have a genuine biblical encounter with God. It is unapologetic, expressed worship. In every form, every time, it it is unapologetic, expressed worship. And somehow we've fallen into a demonic trap, I believe, of of thinking that our worship is something that's private, it's quiet, it's... And we use the term reverent, which I, I I don't really understand where we pulled that into what we do in worship. When we look at God's Word, and God's Word is exactly the opposite. And so, if we take the the basic command from God, from Deuteronomy, and then Jesus affirmed that in Luke and Matthew, uh, at least two of the Gospels that I can think of right now, in Deuteronomy, he said, listen, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your strength and, and your mind. Love the Lord your God with all that you are. God was saying, what I want from you is I want your total being engaged in loving me. I want all that you are engaged in loving me. Now, is that your worship experience? Is that your life experience? Is that what you do on a daily basis? Do you literally allow all that God has given you? That's Oswald Chambers' definition. It's giving back to God the very best, all that he's given us. Do we really engage God with our total being? I told you last week we were going to do a little text survey, didn't I? So get your phone out, all right? Fire it back up because I know all of you that don't have the Bibles open, you've already turned them off so they'd not be a distraction, right? So go ahead and fire them back up. Let's get that going. We're going to do a little text survey this morning. I gave you a whole week to think about this. Let me say one more time. These are blind responses. So I've got my chair turned around. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're saying. Okay? So I can't trace this back and find out how you voted. But it's a real simple question. And I'm just asking you to vote honestly. And maybe even vote on what has been your practice most of your life. Maybe you want to do it that way. But vote honestly. Here we go. You're already answering. Some of you already know how we do this. Here's how you do it. You start with two, 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 three, three, three. That's how you start. See the two? All right, that's where you're sending it to. So put that number, two, two, three, three, three. That's the number that you're sending the text to. And then you start the question or the answer with Riverside Church 
And then you're going to skip a space in capital A or capital B. So you're sending it to 22333. And then in the body of your text, you're going to write Riverside Church. You're going to skip a place and you're going to put A or B. And here's the question for those of you that haven't already looked. When approaching worship, what we do corporately, worship. When approaching worship, the most important question is, what do people want? That would be A. Or B, what does God want? Now, some of you are falling to peer pressure already because you're seeing the numbers go on the screen. Live text, live response, this is your opportunity. What is the most important question we should ask? And again, I'm, I'm muddying it up a little bit, you know, as we think about, uh, about this, what has been your practice. Uh, that may be the way that some of you are responding. But look at this now. Here we go. Everybody participating? You're there. Everybody wants to. You're all over it. Okay, anybody not understand? I want to make it real clear. Because I want everybody to participate that desires to. Obviously, we've got a few people participating. Not, not everybody in the room. All right? Now, now, you see how it's coming out. But the question is, do we honestly believe that? If worship is for and about God, then I'm going to tell you, I, I have to vote B, personally. I have to ask the question, what does God want? Because worship is not about me. In the purest sense, it affects me greatly. But it is not about me. So if I'm truly going to express unapologetic worship to God, then I'm off the table. It, it does not matter what Tony personally wants. And I've shared with you very openly, Michael knows this, there, there's a lot of things we do around here that I don't like in worship, that it's not my personal preference. But what I, I try to do is go to the Scripture, and I also try to see how the Holy Spirit works in worship and how God has chosen worship. And I don't mean just music, but again, the bigger picture of what we do is we get face-to-face -face with God. Then we hear from him that I allow God to speak into my heart and God to direct me. All right, that's good, guys. That's close enough. So it looks like at least those who participated, overwhelmingly, you're saying that it really is, we should ask, what does God want? And I, and I believe that is absolutely correct. When I, I, I think about that, um, several things come to mind. Let me, let me just give you a couple things. We, we talked about this last week. In, in verse 1, we are told, we are given a command from God. That's a little bit of a review. We, talk, we were given a command from God. Because of the singular, the way the grammar is in the text, when he says what he says in verse 1, O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. It literally is a command. It's not an invitation. God is saying through the psalmist, speaking to his people, he's saying, You come. You come. And we know reading the rest of the body, he's saying we come to worship. And so God does command. We wrestled with the question, can you really command someone to worship? And if you read on down through the scripture, if he is Adonai, if he is your Lord, two things are true. A true Lord can command anything he wants. Right? Come on, say right. So he can command us to worship if he is truly Lord. If you have given all that you are over to him, if you've done that with Jesus Christ, then he can command you to do whatever you want. But the second side of that is, is that if you're in right relationship with that Lord, if you're in right relationship with God, you are longing to hear what he commands you to do. It is your daily passion. You want to hear from him. Why? You love him. You have surrendered everything that you are to him. And the question is, Yes, Lord. I mean, the answer to the question before you even hear it is, Yes, Lord. You're my Lord. I love you. So if you tell me to do something, I am ready to do it. There is no rebellion. There is no pushback. There is no debate. He's your Lord. You love him. Now, that might be the rub right there. That might be the biggest problem for a lot of people in the modern church today. Has anyone really been taught what it means to make Christ your Lord? We don't just get fire insurance. We yield our... You, did you get that? Fire insurance is a place called heaven and then there's the other H word, right? You don't just get fire insurance. If you come to Christ, you surrender all. He is Lord. He is Lord. So there's a command, and yes, he can command us to worship. worship. But God does not just say, go worship. 
He doesn't just say, hey, get in here and worship me. But there's coaching. So God literally coaches us up. We've got a command. That was point number one. We've got coaching. That's point number two. Now when I get to today, this is review. When I get to today, you'll see these things on the screen. So there is that coaching that God gives us. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully. We showed the video clip last week from the football game. And Alabama and Auburn were playing. And Auburn had that miraculous play where they came back. And the sound of joy was deafening in that stadium. In fact, it was so loud, it couldn't even register. It was, it was just like white noise. That was an incredible shout. That was an incredible, joyful sound. Now, for the wrong reasons, they were worshiping something that a lot of people do in our world that is not a God, although they've made it their God. I'll leave that alone till next week. All right? We've made it a God. And, 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 but, but there was that unbridled, that unapologetic, expressed worship. It was, it was euphoria because of what had taken place in a silly thing like a football game. So let us shout joyfully to him. So two truths we walked away from. I'll put these on the screen. Here it is. Number one, pure worship is face-to-face -face with God, not activity benefiting others. Pure worship is face-to-face -face with God, not activity benefiting others, all right? You can do acts of worship, but pure worship is you and God. It's not about you mowing someone's lawn. It's not about you buying someone groceries. It's not about you doing some, some uh, humanitarian thing. You know, it's, it's not about you, you know, showing up at Habitat for Humanity twice a year with your mocha soy latte and feeling good about yourself. That's not biblical, pure biblical worship. Biblical worship is you getting in the presence of God. And, and I'm going to really dwell on that this morning. The second thing we walked away with last week, and I've already mentioned it twice this morning. It's on the screen as well. Pure worship does not depend on elements. To do for me what I am expected to do. So it doesn't matter what's going on on this platform, frankly. It doesn't matter what takes place in a classroom in this church. It doesn't matter anywhere. I am not dependent upon elements for me to do what God has commanded me to do. I'm going to engage God. I'm going to worship God because He is worthy. Psalm 29, we looked at it last week. I'm ascribing worth to Him. I am saying, you are worth more. I am worth less. You get a little smile out of that. It's okay. Now, I don't mean worthless. God loves you, obviously. But, but it's saying, I am worth less than you are, God. So it doesn't matter what... I desire. I'm going to your word and I'm going to say, what is pure worship? And it is me ascribing worth to you, period. Unapologetically expressing that incredible love to you. But we've got to go back to that presence thing. The word presence. I want you to write that down, okay? Just write the word presence down. You remember when we saw that back there in the scripture? Let us come before, verse 2, let us come before his presence. This is the one that I have received the most questions about. This is the one that I've seen, uh, that I've received the most uh, uh, concern about. People have asked all kinds of questions about this. They've said, Pastor, we love what we've heard and, and we want to do that. But frankly, frankly, God is a God in the distance for a lot of us. He's not a God that we really understand what it means to be in his presence. Now that word presence is a word which we, again, we talked about it a little bit last week, but it's the word panim or pana is another way to use that word, another form of it. And it, as I've mentioned, it, it's a word which is used often, it's translated most often, most commonly, is a word which means face to face or face is or before the face of. And again, it's, it's just a simple translation. God is saying to us, I want you in my face worshiping me. I want you, listen, to be in my presence. Now, we believe theologically in the omnipresence of God. We believe we're indwelt as believers of the Holy Spirit. And we believe that God is everywhere. Uh, almost two years ago, we looked at a study on the Holy Spirit and we were reminded that, listen, while God is omnipresent, He is everywhere, God desires to be manifest 
in your presence. And there's a difference than a theological understanding of the omnipresence of God and actually experiencing God manifest face to face daily in our lives. And that is found throughout the Bible. And here's the disconnect where I believe, again, the modern church is completely lost. Now that doesn't mean that many people understand it and many people are experiencing it. But I believe by and large we have no understanding. We want to see God from an intellectual understanding. We want to see God in theory and we want to know that he's there. But again, he's distant. And you begin to talk about God speaking personally through his word and, and applying it through the Holy Spirit. And there's that, that blind look, or as we used to say in the South, uh, like a calf looking at a new gate. I was around cows all my life. I never really understood what that meant, but that's what they say. And so there's that, that look that, man, you, you're a nut. I don't know what you're talking about because we've approached God from such a safe distance for so long. We really, really are not sure what it means to be face to face and hear Him speak into our heart with His Word and affirming it by His Spirit. So what is that? I couldn't just leave that alone, so I want to walk through this just a little bit. It's face or faces or front. God, God desires that we worship Him face to face. Let me give you a couple of things of, of how. Could I give you a couple of practical things about how to experience His presence, how to live there? Would that help you? Okay, good. Here we go. Number one, you have to meet Him and with Him. You have to meet Him and with him. I, I should have constructed that a little differently, but what I'm saying is you have to meet him first and then you have to meet with him regularly. All right? Now you can't miss this. You have to meet him first and you meet him regularly beyond that. And what do I mean by meet him? First of all, this is a personal God and your relationship to him comes through a relationship that is personal. It is through His Son, Jesus Christ. And you have to have an experience in your life, an encounter in your life. We call it conversion often. Jesus called it being born again. It's when you come, the Holy Spirit of God draws you, begins to open up your heart. And you hear the story of Jesus Christ. You hear what he did and why he came. And you hear that story. And the very living spirit of God that we keep referencing opens up your heart. And you by his grace and power are able to say yes to Christ and what he's done in your life. And you receive the gift of eternal life. And you are literally forgiven for every sin you've ever committed. You are filled with the very person of the Holy Spirit that started the whole process to guide you the rest of your life and you are forever changed you don't get over it you don't forget about it you can't walk away from it because it is all a supernatural act of God that's meeting him a lot of people have religion a lot of people go to church. A lot of people are spiritual. I believe the Bible is real clear. The, the road is narrow. The gate is narrow who, that leads to eternal life. And few are they who find it. The Bible says the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many go down that road. And I believe with all my soul that in this room this morning there are people that are headed on the broad road. You're walking down the broad road. You've never actually met Him. You've never been radically changed by him you're trying to do better you're trying to be moral you're trying to make a difference in this world but you have to meet Christ in order to really experience and live in his presence huge difference folks huge difference have you met him you may say well I, I, I think then you haven't I hope so then you haven't well my family told you haven't if you meet Jesus Christ and he makes you an entirely new creature, there's no way you could not know about it. You, you can't be changed completely and be unaware of it. It's real simple, right? But it doesn't end there. It's meeting him, yes, but it's meeting with him. I reference Hebrews 10 and, and for years and years and years, God's people could never come into the presence of God. In fact, only one man 
one day a year could come into the presence of God. And, and that was the high priest. That was the one that had been appointed to meet with God. And he would go in and, and literally pour out all this blood and, and, and making sacrifices, trying to cover the sins of the people. And he himself, he had to go through seven days of a specialized cleansing for him to even go in there. And then sometimes there were even no guarantees. I, if I remember correctly, sometimes they'd even tie a rope on him in case he died in there, in case he wasn't right. And they could pull him back out. I mean, it was a big deal. And the people like you and like me, we didn't have a shot at getting into the presence of God. But then Jesus came. And Jesus made the final sacrifice for all of that, for all of us. And, and Jesus literally opened that veil of that holy place where only that high priest could go once a year. And now you and I, literally according to Hebrews chapter 10, we can live in his presence every day. We can dwell there because of what Christ has done. Are you taking advantage of that? Are you meeting with him face to face? Do you understand what a privilege? Do you understand what an honor you have? Do you understand what a luxury it is? Oh, not just to come and do your Bible study, not just to open up some devotional book, but I'm talking about getting up in his grill and telling him how much you love him. You see, that's the starting point for the presence of God. Listen to Hebrews 10. Let me read a couple of those verses. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, that means they don't have to tie a rope to you. While we have confidence by the blood of Jesus, they sang about it a few moments ago, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's Jesus, let us draw near, near his presence, right? Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And listen to verse 25. And not skipping church on Sunday. Loose translation. Not forsaking our own assembly together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the, the day drawing near. Do you believe the day is drawing near? Yes. You believe we're getting closer to the end? Yes. Yeah. Hey, if you don't have your head in the sand, it's pretty obvious, right? And so, man, we need to be meeting more and more. That means every opportunity we have to come together and worship as a family of God, God's telling us right there in His Word, don't forsake that, don't miss that, don't skip that. It's important. I don't know about you, but sometimes I want to look in the mirror and say, Tony, do you ever read the Bible? Because I read this stuff and I go, whoa! How do I forget that stuff? How do, I, how do I miss that? That is awesome. You can daily walk in His presence. Don't you like that? Turn to your neighbor and say, I like it. No, no, you didn't do well. Let's try it again. Turn to your neighbor and say, I like that. I like it. Come on. There you go. So we meet him and we meet with him. But the second thing is you've got to remain sensitive. Remain sensitive. Boy, this one's hard. I'm telling you, the older I get, the harder it is. Now, right now, I'm, I, God, I'm just kind of in a personal revival, right? And so it's good and sweet and everything's great with God and I'm walking. But I'm telling you, the older I get, it's hard. I get cranky. I get set in my ways. I like what I like, just like you do. And so I had to battle this thing. Sherry and I look at each other all the time and she said, Let, let's never get bitter. Let, let's never get bitter. Let's always stay just hot for the Lord. Let, let's, let's do whatever it takes for our hearts to stay on fire. And, you know, we really do talk about that. And, and so he's telling us we, we've got to remain sensitive.